Cheers, YouTube. Um, this video is going to be a little bit different. Um, as a lot of you know, I've been doing a lot of conventional fishing, but my main job, what I do for work, is I am a fly fishing guide. I guide at Pyramid Lake, and I guide on the Truckee River. I'm on the California side. I don't have permits for the Nevada side quite yet. But um, So I'm going to kind of walk you guys through how I prepare for a guide trip. When I first started this, um, guiding is kind of this like mystified profession, right? So you think like, I'm going to be a fishing guide, I'm going to take people fishing, and it's going to be the most incredible job ever, and it is. It's very cool, it's a very fun, rewarding job, but there is a ton of prep work that goes in before and after the trip to make sure that everything goes smoothly and everybody is as prepared as we can be. I did not really know that. I mean, I understood that because I fly fish my whole life and I prepare for trips. But when you are preparing for two or three people that are amateurs, that are going to lose a lot of flies, that are going to break off a lot, that are going to break rods, there's a lot of things that come into play that you don't necessarily think about when you think about being a fishing guy. So I'm going to kind of walk you guys through my process. Um, typically what I do is if, if I have a day before a couple days of guiding in a row, I'll sit down and I'll tie some flies. Um, the flies that we fish on the Truckee are kind of specific to the Truckee. Big river, flows about 400 CFS, so it's a lot of water, so we fish really heavy flies. Um, ideally we fish one really heavy fly that gets our whole rig down and then we can fish smaller flies. The small flies we fish are very standard, caddis patterns, mayfly patterns, midges, I mean, you name it. Hairs, ears, pheasant tails, uh, two-bit hookers, waltz worms, like attractor patterns, just really the standard stuff. But the biggest thing is making sure our flies get down. And we do a lot of high sticking or euro nymphing um, on the Truckee. So um, I'm gonna kind of show you guys a couple of the, or I'm gonna show you one of the specific patterns and then you can kind of elaborate. We tie literally whatever we want as the flies beyond this. Um, but we're gonna tie those flies. I'm gonna show you kind of how I prepare the day before. So I have a trip on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It's Tuesday today, so I'm going to sit down, I'm gonna tie flies. Tomorrow I have the day off, I'm gonna go fish. Um, I was on a trip recently, so I wasn't able to just keep fishing. Um, so I need to go do a little bit of recon, figure out where I wanna take people. The water that I go fish specifically for myself is a lot different than the water that I guide because the Truckee is a very dangerous river. Um, big, slippery boulders, it's not the most fun place to wade. And once you're in waders, it gets a little bit sketchy if you don't know what you're doing or if your guide is taking you to the wrong place. I wet wade just in case somebody does go in. I can jump in the water and swim to them safely, grab them, and can be as prepared as possible. But So I, I do my recon in different areas than I would normally fish myself. So. Tomorrow we're gonna do that, but right now we're gonna tie some flies. We're gonna fish tomorrow, and then tomorrow night I'm gonna show you how I rig up rods, um, get the waders and stuff that people are gonna need. Because most people that fish the Truckee are in Tahoe for a couple days. They want to go fish. They want to experience what it's like. Um, whereas Pyramid is people that go to Pyramid typically are experienced anglers that really, really, really want to catch a big fish. So I'm gonna get tying on these. I'm gonna show you one of my favorite heavy, heavy stone flies that I tie. Um, I tie crayfish, I tie sculpted patterns, I tie all kinds of crap, but I'm going to show you this specific fly and then you can elaborate yourself, but let's get to it. Alright you guys, as I said earlier, we have a very specific pattern that we fish. I have a specific way that I tie these flies. Um, I like to start out with, it doesn't really matter what bead, Alan just has good stuff. Um, this is a five and a half millimeter tungsten bead. Like I said, extremely heavy. This is humongous. And when it's on this fly, it looks kind of funny. Um, I'll tie this in either black nickel or copper. Gold works. Um, you know, you have a favorite bead color, fish it. But, um, and then I have a, pair, a set of Umqua U555 jig hooks. These are size 12. As what I like to do is I mash the barb. You only have to get hooked in the head one time. Uh, to realize that you should probably just always crimp your barbs. But I mash the, all the barbs first and then what I'll do is I'll put all of my beads on that I'm going to use. Okay, so I'll put this hook on the bead and you'll see this and you'll be like, that's kind of funny looking. And I couldn't agree more. Pretty hilarious looking uh, rig. 
Um, as far as thread color goes, I'm gonna kind of bury all of the thread that I'm using. Uh, golden stones are typically brown and goldish, so I kind of usually stick with some sort of a dark brown or brown thread. You don't need any lead wraps on this, thankfully, because it's such a heavy fly already. But I'll just kind of add some wraps right at the back of this. Actually, let's do this. Let's make it so you can see a little better. Okay. I'll add some wraps to kind of just try and seat this bead so it's not flying around on me too much. And I'll migrate my thread backwards. For my golden stones, I kind of like this tan, these tan silly legs. Uh, I honestly have no clue who, made, who makes these. If you just look up silly legs for fly tying, you'll see exactly what these are. Um, so I'll cut off some of these, and again, I'll prep the I'll prep this for a couple flies usually. But right now, I'll just show you one. So I'll make one cut here that'll yield me a nice small piece like that. That'll be my tail, and I kind of go. I'm pretty minimalist as far as my um, body legs on my stonefly patterns. Some people try to get really, or they get really realistic. The tricky is so fast and so quick. Um, the fish don't have a whole lot of time to look at your fly. Some people argue with me to the death about that, but that's just my opinion. So they don't, they don't have enough time to look at this, in my opinion, to justify having some extreme, hyper realistic bug. So what I'll do is I'll take these legs. Tie those in. In order to be mostly even, they can be kind of cattywampus. Your clients are more than likely going to lose this immediately. <laughs> so I'll do that. I like that. It's okay. It looks fine. You want them to be pretty enough that fish eat them, but also you don't want to spend so much time that you're going to be sad if you lose it. Okay. So set of legs there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie in some thin skin. This is just a nearly translucent body material. You want to tie it a little thick. You want this to basically cover the whole back of it, like so. Um, there's two schools of thought. There's tying on a jig, there's tying the underbody as what you would think of the top of the fly since it rides hook point up. But the way that this presents, imagine it kind of tilts down a little bit like this. The way this presents technically, the top part of this fly is going to actually present to the fish first. So I like to tie this on top, plus it's way more convenient than tying it freaking underneath this hook point. It's hard to tie in a couple different materials in there. So what I'll do, and I'm going to tie this in right here. This actually is still probably a little too thick, but I'll just tie the fly a little bit thicker to compensate for that. The other thing you need to think about too, there's a lot of things that dictate the sink rate of a fly. So you can have it as heavy as you want, but if it's too bulky and it's too thick, it's gonna slow the sink rate down. So just like if you have all of your weight at the head versus all of your weight throughout the fly, this will sink way faster because this is going to lead the fly down. Whereas if you have just lead wraps tied on it, it's just gonna sink uniformly. This will pull the whole thing down Whereas if you wrap it with lead, it'll just nicely sink. It'll still sink, but it won't sink nearly as fast. And we're going for as heavy and as quick sinking of a fly as we can possibly bear to, to use. So just some food for thought. Now we're gonna take, this is a nice little golden dub right here. I usually like to mix a little bit of ice dub into my, into my gold dub. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna mix these Fish love UV. I don't know if you've noticed this, but this will catch two to one if I just mix in a tiny bit of UV. And that's what that finishing color is like. A little bit of purple strand in there, but nothing too crazy. And then also, you want this to have ribs. So I've tied this in. I actually did this backwards. You want to do this first. I'm going to take a gold wire. Again, sticking with the theme of golden stonefly. I'm going to take a gold wire. This is almost a yellow gold. It's a little bit... All right, this needs to chill. I'm gonna take this, tie in this wire as well. We're gonna. This is essentially gonna add some durability, and it's gonna segment the body pretty well. I'm gonna take some of the dub that I just tied, or that I just mixed, and I'm gonna start wrapping. A nice tight dubbing noodle is what you're looking for here. You don't want too thick. 
because you can always add a little bit more but if you tie it too thick it just looks a little goofy and it's not uniform and again we're just going for a tight slim profile here to create the illusion of this being a stonefly but also sinking way quicker than a normal Pat's rubber legs or something along those lines would sink. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up just like so. Right about there, put a little too much dub on. I'm gonna use more of this dub, but for now that's about where I want it. Finish right there. Okay, I'm gonna take my thin skin, I'm gonna fold it over just like so. Now what that's doing, I don't know if you can see that, but that's actually wrapping around the body a little bit. Now I'm gonna take this gold wire and again we're just segmenting this and causing that thin skin to wrap around the body creating a thinner more streamlined profile that's going to sink faster I'm going to wrap this I'm going to break that and I'm going to fold this back because we're going to use this some more I'm going to leave that sticking back like that I'm going to take another set of silly legs right here as you can see and I'm gonna tie these in now, right up here, like so. And I'm gonna space them so they look nice, just like that. And then I like to pull mine a little bit and add a couple wraps in between just to space them out a little bit more. I think it looks a little bit more natural that way. But what's natural when you're tying feathers? And then I'm gonna take this again and tie it in just like so. Okay, that looks good. It's a little bit long, but that's okay. You can always trim them. I'm gonna take some more of my dub. And you see, I mean, this is a pretty few material fly. It's not super crazy. A lot of guys get nuts with these patterns. And I personally just don't have the patience. And I haven't noticed a big enough difference in catch rates, personally, to justify all these crazy setups and flies that people tie. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna wrap this. I'm just kind of wrapping it through these legs to help it like so. Okay, and as you can see, they're a little too long. That's okay. So I'm gonna come right here. I'm gonna fold this over like so, not too tight. I actually need to push these legs back a little bit further. And again, you'll kind of get this process down a little bit more, be a little more streamlined. Once you get past the second and third fly, you get a pretty good efficiency going. But I just want to push these legs back a little bit further. The best way to do that is just take some dub and tie them back so they stick back a little further, just like so. Perfect. I'm going to take this, I'm going to fold this up, just like so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push it back and I'm folding it backwards and I'm creating a wing case now. So I'm going to do that right there. Looks yummy. It might be a little long actually, so we're going to redo that. Okay, just a light fold there. Just like so. Do one more light fold here. And we'll do one more the rim top of that and I'm, all I'm doing is I'm just pushing that back and folding a tiny bit of that skin over I'm gonna cut this to finish the fly I'm just gonna take a little bit more dub I'm just gonna wrap this around the head and that's it a guide fly at its finest but is a very effective pattern catches a lot of fish whip finish as a lot of you know, I'm a sucker for a bunch of super glue. So I'm gonna take some glue, which is somewhere on my desk. I'll spare you the detail while I search for that. But these legs on this side are a touch too long. So I'm just gonna take this, eyeball it, trim those so it's a little too short there. Trim that side, and now we're about even. So as you can see, not a super fancy fly but looks close enough to a golden stone and it is extremely heavy. So that is a perfect anchor fly. I'm gonna get time on a couple more of these things. Um, I'm gonna spare you. The 
All right, you guys, it's 6.15 in the morning. Um, I was up a little too late tying flies last night. You'll find that that's, I mean, for me personally, I don't plan well enough and I have a hard time making myself go to bed at the right time. The brutal thing about the Trekkie right now is the water temps are getting high by noon or one o'clock. So we fish hard um, from like sun up until about 11, 11.30, and then we gotta leave the fish alone. So it doesn't give me a huge window to get clients into fish, especially with the technical ability re required to catch fish on the Trekkie. But um, me going and doing this myself will give me, will give me a good feeling of what we're looking at and where we should be. So let's get on the road, find some fish. So I've made it down to the zone I want to start at. Nice cold water. Makes for happy trout. Just trying to see how safe and accessible this is. Looks decent though. A nice deep pocket on the far side. Lots of good looking stuff, so. Time to start picking apart some pockets. So, with high sticking, urine nymphing, whatever you want to call it, the fish, basically we're taking advantage of a heavy fly, that's a fish, on the first cast. No way. <laughs> right away. As I was saying before I was rudely interrupted, we're taking advantage of heavy flies that get down into zones that the fish are holding in you just have to find them and you have to get down to them. And as easy as that sounds, on certain rivers, it's a lot harder than you'd think. It's kind of like make seven, eight casts, catch a fish or two, move on. Seven, eight casts, catch a fish or two, move on. So it's kind of a nice active way to go about doing this. People enjoy it because they're learning a new technique. And don't forget, every single boulder has a fish behind it. If you approach this place with this, with that mindset, that every boulder has a fish behind it, you'll, you'll find success. Watch out for trees. <laughs> All right, not getting a ton of love. So switch flies. Left my stuff down here, so I'm gonna grab this. And I'm gonna continue just working my way up this. There's a lot of water I just fished that I think probably really should have had a fish in it. So I have my normal spots that I like to guide. And if one spot, you know, if I come scout, it doesn't work out. It's not like we don't have another spot to go to. But you wanna at least fish this stuff a little bit. Keep it honest, spend some time kind of figuring out what's going on. That's all we're doing here. There you go. Again, this is summertime on the truck. He looks a lot like this. A lot of small fish on the hunt for a decent one. There you go. There's a nice little fishy there. One rod in hand. Better where he should have been. A little bit better of a rainbow. On the on oh on the heavy fly. Let's go down here. I got a net on me, but it's 
For this size of fish, it's not really worth pulling off unless it's a client. All right. Hate my big anchor fly. Crayfish. Again, not a huge fish, but fought hard and it's fun to catch. Let's keep going up. All right. That was a pretty good little scouting session. Um, obviously not epic, but when you're fishing the Truckee, you can't really ask for epic unless it's, if it's spring or fall, when you actually have some decent water temperatures for the fish. I'm probably not gonna go super hard in this zone, but I definitely wanna at least fish it and check it out. Um, as I said earlier, most of the water that I really like fishing is not in this zone. This is a very busy part of the Truckee right here. Um, and I don't like competing. I don't like getting in a zone and having to see 50 other people that are all trying to catch fish in the same exact spot as me. And it's just less than ideal. But we're gonna go back to the house uh, and I'm gonna prep this evening and kind of take you guys along for how I prepare in terms of rigging rods, getting waders and boots and all that stuff all set up. So come along and let's, uh, yeah, I'll show you how that's done. All right, you guys, back at the garage. Full disclosure, this is not my garage. Uh, we're living with my in-laws right now. Uh, the whole pandemic going on was a little weird for my income and we weren't sure we were gonna be able to pay rent for a little while there. So we moved in with the in-laws, saving some money, hopefully we can buy a house. But yeah, I don't want anybody thinking that I'm well off because my father-in-law makes money, but I'm a fishing guy, so I don't make that much money. But uh, yeah, so as far as rigging and pre-trip, uh, evening goes, I like to rig up my rods, get everything set aside that I need to take, um, tie up flies, you know, kind of go through all the, the things that you would assume, but um, drinks are a big thing that I, you never really think about. So like I have an ice chest that has ice, you have to get ice for it. <laughs> uh, you know, water bottles, some beer, some soda, um, depending on your client, some people will love it. You'll love you if you offer them beer, some people hate you if you offer them beer and they want to drink soda. As far as rigging goes, um, I rig most of my rods the exact same way. Uh, we have a 10 foot, three weight. I'm not a super big gear snob. Um, so any 10 foot, three weight will do. We have a heavy point fly, about 18 inches to a tag end that has a size 16 or 18 little betas pattern, something small. I run about eight feet of tippet to a tippet ring. Above that is my cider, and then tied to the cider is about 35 feet of um, 10 pound monofilament line. Uh, I use Maxima Ultra Green. It's a nice mono. Um, works really well. It's a little stretchy, so it's, it protects your tippet, but it's strong enough that you can set a hook pretty well and drive a hook into a fish's mouth. So that's as far as rigging goes. I bring two high sticking rods. I have two people tomorrow, so two high sticking rods. I bring one nine foot five weight. That's basically if, just in case they break. A rod which happens a lot of people grab their rod at the top like they're bass fishing when they're boat flipping and they'll snap rods that way and they do it so fast i can't be like hey, hey, hey don't do that <laughs> but um so i have that it has an indicator set up on it just in case uh, we want a different presentation maybe there's a run that we just can't quite reach to with the high sticking rigs but pretty straightforward as far as reading the rods go ice chest uh the lady i have is a size eight boot i got a pair of nine waders for her She's five foot eight, so I got a pair of larges that she's gonna fit into. The guy's six one, he's got a size 10 and a half foot, so I got an XL waiter for him, a little tall. Um, pretty straightforward stuff there. Um, waters, like I said, drinks. Uh, I have my little guide bag right here. This thing, the Sims bag kind of holds everything. Water bottles, I can hold four of them at a time. Um, you know, flies that I really need to get into fit in this front pocket. Uh, things that are, I want easy access to, tip it, split shots. You know, basically that's it. Tippet split shots and flies. That's really what it goes into what my rigs are right now. Um, that's a nice bag. Holds my camera. Holds a, holds a coat if for when it's cold in the morning. Um, I usually wet wade when I'm with clients for safety. Uh, it's a little chilly for me, but if somebody does go in and falls in and they fill up their waders, even if they have a wader belt on, it happens. Me not being in waders is a super important thing because I can chase them down anything safely 
get to them and help the situation without being even more dangerous and filling my own waders. So summertime, I don't wear waders. I just wet wave the whole time, but pretty straightforward. Um, and yeah, that's basically all the prep that goes into it. There's not a ton of stuff. Uh, a lot of it's just kind of spans over time, you know, fishing, fishing the zones before you go fit, before you guide people there, knowing what rigs are working, knowing what flies are working, but a lot of it doesn't change through the summertime here. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's one thing I want to go over that I think a lot of people miss the mark on as guides. So a lot of people mystify guiding, right? So being a fishing guide, it's this lucrative job. It's not lucrative, really. It's this, you know, dream job <laughs> of taking people fishing and all you do is just fish all the time. And like, though it is an incredible job and it's super fun and it's really fulfilling to get people into fish, it's a job. It's work. It's hard. It's not easy. Um, it's stressful. Not catching fish is stressful. Um, but you know, the, the, a part, the biggest thing we can do as guides is work really, really hard at teaching as best we can. So I consider myself a teacher first and a fish netter second. Um, I want them to learn. I tell every client that I book that I don't want them to ever have to hire me again. I want them to be able to come out here and do it on their own. Most of the time they'll rehire me because of that solely because I work really, really hard to get my clients into fish um, and to teach them why and what and where. Like there's a lot of questions that people have that they don't ask because they don't even know it's something they need to ask when they're fly fishing, when they're learning. But the funniest thing to me about fly fishing is a lot of it takes years to learn and minutes to teach. There are things that people do poorly on their cast that you can fix in minutes. It, it took them a long time to get to that point. And there are things that people can do different in their line management and things that you can teach them that I have observed over 10 years of fishing that way and getting better and learning and figuring out what does and doesn't work for fish. Um, and it takes me minutes to teach that to somebody. So the biggest thing is just making sure that you are teaching people to the best of your ability and it will never lead you astray in my opinion i think that people want to learn even if they don't think they want to learn they want to learn they need to learn um and once they do learn then they'll catch fish and that's kind of the progression i tell people like here's your average fly angler here's the required ability skill set needed to catch fish on the trucky so my job is to get them from here to here and then once they're here then we can start talking about catching fish but until they get to here, they're not going to even hook a fish. They're not even going to see a fish. So, you know, just some food for thought. Uh, for those those of you that are, like, considering getting into this industry and considering getting into guiding, um, there's a lot that goes into this that people don't think about. And there's a lot of things that you learn over time. And I have not been guiding for a long time. I'm not a 10, 15, 20-year guide. I'm a three-year, four-year guide. So I have a lot, of, lot to learn as far as guiding goes. But what's worked for me is making sure people learn and teaching people as best as I can. And... I've yet to have that fail me. I've had some slow days fishing, and that's just being a guide, especially on the freaking Truckee River. It's not a 10,000 fish per mile river. It's not a 5,000 fish per mile. It's not even a 2,500 fish per mile. It's like 1,200. Like that's not a whole lot of fish for a river that flows at 400 CFS. That's quite a few fish, or that's not that many fish. That's quite few fish for the size of the river. So with these fish holding in weird water and not that many, you know, you got to take advantage of all of the good water that you can, and if you make bad passes through, you're not gonna hook fish. So, you gotta learn how to get, you know, gotta learn how to fish through it. But appreciate all you guys watching. Um, like I said, please leave a comment, like, subscribe. Um, all of that does, all of that supports me and what I'm doing. I don't really make any money from this. I get like 50 bucks a month in views from making these videos. So, um, everything that you guys do to support me, it makes it all worth it for me. So, appreciate you guys, and I'll see you next week.